Greetings and salutations everyone. My name is Andrew Kirchhoff and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today we're talking about the one and only thing that we need to be talking about. Odell Beckham Jr. has been traded to the Cleveland Browns. Oh my goodness. I mean the 2019 NFL free agent frenzy, I mean it does not disappoint. I, I don't remember another season that has been this jam-packed with free agent signings that have the implications that they do going into the fantasy football season. There's a lot of big named players that are moving and I mean it's it's almost hard to keep track of. So today we're going to be talking about Odell Beckham Jr. His value as he <laughs> is becoming the newest member of the Cleveland Browns. And then we're going to also talk about the outlook on the respective players on the Cleveland Browns and the New York Giants. We're going to be talking about Baker Mayfield, uh, Jarvis Landry, David Njoku, the running backs, Nick Chubb, Kareem Hunt, how their value stacks um, with the addition of Odell Beckham Jr. And then we're going to also go and talk about the outlook of uh, whether or not you know guys like Saquon Barkley, Sterling Shepard, Evan Ingram either get a, a bump due to this trade or perhaps can potentially be hurt from the departure of Odell Beckham. But without further ado, let's get into that and uh, let's, let's talk about it, shall we? Hey everybody, how's it going? Okay, so... Oh my goodness, it's it's pretty insane, but it's exciting, right? Uh, just like yesterday's uh, episode that I put out, old faces, new places, players are moving, and the free agency frenzy, it's not over, right? We had a, a bunch of other names defensively, offensively move around today, but the biggest name to move around this afternoon was Odell Beckham Jr., the wide receiver for the New York Giants. So let's talk a little bit about Odell Beckham. We all know he's fantastic, but what exactly did the Cleveland Browns give up in order to <laughs> go ahead and take Odell Beckham, a young player in his prime, away from the Giants? So the Browns, obviously, they get in return Odell Beckham, but what did they have to give? They gave up this year's first-round pick. Uh, they also gave up a third-round pick from this year. And they also gave up Jabril Peppers, uh, safety. He was drafted last year in the first round by the Cleveland Browns. So technically, they get two first-round picks and a third-round pick um, for Odell Beckham Jr. But, you know, you're sending away your best off. I mean, he's not the best offensive player. I think Saquon Barkley, after his performance last year, has kind of taken that mantle. So your second-best offensive player, a young wide receiver, you're giving him up. You're getting two first-round picks, um, yet you still have to pay the dead cap of $17 million um, that Odo Beckham is going to you know, cost you. I failed to mention that when I talked about Antonio Brown a couple days back um, in the fact that you know the Steelers have to pay Antonio Brown to play for the Raiders this year. And that's exactly what the Giants have. The Giants go have to go ahead and they have to pay Odo Beckham to play for another team. And that's unfortunate, but they... Uh, they thought that this was a smart idea. I personally don't think this was a smart idea. I am ecstatic um, for the Cleveland Browns organization. This is fantastic. It brings another uh, sense of you know energy into the organization in order to try to turn this franchise around to get them um, over that hump. You know they they had eight wins last season after going 0 and 16 the year prior. So um, this is another great addition for, by the front office of the the Cleveland Browns to go ahead and turn the culture around and bring in another player that can help um, Baker Mayfield in this offense get to that next level. So obviously we went over that um, when it comes to the trade and what exactly broke down there. I don't know what the Giants are doing, man. The Giants are they're confusing me at times, but you know, I, I we got to live with it. We got to for those of you who are Giants fans, uh, this is probably a really bad taste in your mouth. Uh, you still have Saquon, um, but unless they go out and they draft a quarterback with this first round pick or, you know, really make some some smart decisions with the the two first round picks they're going to have theirs and the Cleveland Browns this season, um, man, this is a, it's a questionable decision for them. Anyway, so let's talk about a little bit of Odell Beckham. Obviously, we know he is as talented as they come. He is a young wide receiver. He's only been in the league since 2014. Um, the first three seasons of Odell Beckham's career, I mean, we all know he's he's ridiculous. He broke records in his first three seasons as a part of the New York Giants. Dude had 228 uh, receptions, 4,122 receiving yards, and a total of 35 receiving touchdowns. On average, in his first three seasons, he had 96 receptions, 1,374 yards, 
and 11.66 receptions per season on average. I mean, that's ridiculous. This guy's an absolute monster. And statistically, obviously, we know he has the talent. He has the, the playmaking ability. And with, with Eli Manning, he was able to produce these numbers. Imagine what happens when you go into an offense with a Baker Mayfield with an arm like that, with a talent like that. How much you're going to improve. When you have another wide receiver like Jarvis Landry on the field and you have Nick Chubb, Kareem Hunt, David Njoku, he is only going to get better due to the fact that he is on a better team that has more weapons, more threats. It's going to you know, open up more opportunity for him to make plays. Now, the last two seasons for Odell Beckham, as you, you saw, I mentioned the first three seasons that he played in the NFL. These last two seasons, um, he's been hit with the injury bug, which is unfortunate. He's only played 16 of the 32 possible games in the last two seasons. In 2017, he had fractured his ankle, uh, which held him out for majority uh, of the season. I think uh, he missed about 12, 12 games. I think he played only four games that season. Um, so he missed 12 games in that span. Um, in which, you know, he started off great too. He, he was still putting up statistical numbers that, you know, Odo Beckham is used to. Uh, this past season in 2018, um, from I think he played the first 12 weeks. Yes, he played the first 12 weeks. And then from week uh, 13 through 17, he dealt with a quad injury. And to be honest, uh, the, the Giants organization, they weren't going to make the playoffs. And they thought, okay, why force him back from an injury when we can go ahead, rest him for the future? Uh, who knew they were going <laughs> to be parting ways with him in the future, but either way, I'm glad they, they held him out in order to not risk any more injury considering he'd missed so many games <clears throat> prior to that season. So um, th- the fact of the matter is still in 2018, you guys may be thinking, oh, you know, he had Eli, he must have not been good, Saquon was statistically a monster. That really wasn't the case because Odell Beckham was still a solid wide receiver. In 2018, um Having only played 12 games, he had 195.84 half-point PPR scoring points um, on average in the 12 weeks that he played. That's 16.32 half-point PPR points. 16 points per week. I mean, in the half-point PPR, this guy was uh, a solid second-round pick if he was able to get there. Um, But when I talk about second-round pick, I'm talking about like uh, in in a 2QB format. I'm sure that... Uh, in some 12-team leagues, 14-team leagues, he's probably gone in the first round. Uh, just depends. But anyway, we know what he's capable of. We know what he's capable of with Eli Manning under center. Imagine what he's going to be with Baker Mayfield in this in this offense. I mean, I, I'm excited. This is fantastic. Um, wow. Whew, here we go. So let's talk about the implications and the outlook of other players outside of Odell Beckham. We know he's going to produce. He is one of the best wide receivers in the NFL. In fantasy football, even with Eli at quarterback, he is a top eight, nine wide receiver in the NFL in fantasy football terms, right? So going into this, I think he goes up uh, a couple notches, a couple tiers. Uh, I would have probably said that he was probably in, in the back end due to the fact that Eli Manning was his quarterback. He probably would have been around like the 8th or 9th uh, ranked wide receiver. Now that this is the case, I mean, there, there's arguments for him to, to be jumping and being, you know, the the 5th or 4th um, ranked wide receiver for the 2019 season. Obviously, um, we'll just have to... I, I got to do my rankings. I got to reorganize it, kind of uh, break it down that way. But uh, I can see him... Moving up draft boards, absolutely, um, come 2019 um, drafts when they start to begin. Anyway, so let's go ahead and let's talk about Baker Mayfield, okay? What was Baker Mayfield able to do last season, and how is he going to improve upon that um, with the addition to Odo Beckham? Obviously, Kareem Hunt is on this team as well. We don't know what his suspension is going to be, but obviously, when he shows up, this team will improve even more. But that being said, so last season, um, you know, Baker Mayfield threw for 20, he threw 27 touchdowns. Um, he played in 14 games in which he started 13 of those games. I think uh, the first game that he played was against the Jets, Monday Night Football. Tyrod Taylor got that concussion. He came in, finished the game, won the game. Um, but other than that, he started 13 games this last season. In those 13 games, <clears throat> uh, they threw the ball 37 times per game. Um, on average, he had 27 touchdowns, leading to about two per game. Uh, two, two touchdowns per game in a and in six point per passing touchdown formats. Um, in the 13 starts that Baker Mayfield had, 
He averaged nearly 21.86 fantasy points in six point per passing touchdown leagues. I mean, goodness gracious, Baker Mayfield was a monster. Now, if you guys, or if any of you, uh, I don't know if you're new to the channel. If you are new to the channel, click that subscribe button for more content. Um, but a couple weeks back um, on the Kirkoff podcast, I went and had, uh, and I completed a super flex mock draft. In that draft, I took Baker Mayfield as my second quarterback after uh, Andrew Luck. And I'm telling you, even prior to this um this move, I thought Baker Mayfield was going to be a top 12 quarterback next season. Now that this move is taking place, oh my goodness, his value is going to go through the ceiling. It is absolutely going to go through the season, the ceiling. Because let's think about quarterbacks in their second year and how they've produced in the last couple seasons. Uh, we saw Carson Wentz and Jared Goff in their first years. Yeah, they struggled here and there. But in their second year, we saw Carson Wentz, I mean... <laughs> Uh, prior to his ACL injury, he was the MVP of the league. We saw Jared Goff make leaps and bounds. Both these players, right? The first and second round, uh, first and second overall picks of that draft. Those two quarterbacks, they are pretty good quarterbacks now, right? They've made their steps. They've improved. Okay. Other than that, let's talk about the 2017 draft where Patrick Mahomes and Deshaun Watson um, were drafted. In their second years, I mean, we saw what kind of damage they were capable of. So if all the quarterbacks that were drafted in the in the uh, 2018 NFL draft, who is the, the most capable or most likely quarterback to step up and improve even more? It's got to be Baker Mayfield at this point. That, that leaves him in pretty elite company when it comes to the quarterback position as we enter the 2019 fantasy football season. Goodness, uh, he, he's going to be a, uh, a pretty expensive uh, quarterback to take and uh, we'll talk about that as the season progresses or the offseason progresses but uh, he's definitely gonna he's gonna cost a pretty penny to get him now uh, like I mentioned um, he had 27 passing touchdowns 3,725 passing yards 131 rushing yards um, decent you know almost 64 percent passing completion which was pretty good uh, considering it was his rookie year and considering the fact that um, his second and third best wide receiver after Jarvis Landry was Antonio Callaway and Rashad Higgins, and then you know Duke Johnson and uh, Rashad Perriman. So those guys aren't really the most talented. The the second leading receiver on this team was David Njoku. So that all being said, I think Baker Mayfield outperformed m- which many people thought he was going to do um, in his rookie season. So another stat that I want to mention uh, before we talk about um, a couple other players is. Uh, Baker Mayfield's efficiency in the red zone really quickly just to kind of highlight just how good he was this season right a lot of people may overlook the fact that Baker Mayfield had an outstanding season but in the red zone this year um, he was tied for the 11th most passing touchdowns in the red zone he had 20 passing touchdowns um, on red zone opportunities and I only threw yeah he threw zero interceptions uh, had 116 um I think his is it QBR? No, I don't think it was QBR. Uh, yeah, I think it may have been QBR. 116.2 QBR, if I'm not mistaken. Someone's got to stat check that one. I didn't write it down. Um, and he had nearly a 67% passing completion. So in the red zone, he was hyper efficient. Zero turnovers, 20 passing touchdowns. He was fantastic. And I only think he's going to improve. So <laughs> um, Baker Mayfield's getting a bump. I'm I'm pretty upset about that. I thought in a 2QB league, I'd be able to sneak grab um, Baker Mayfield. But now, I mean, I'm going to have to overpay or I'm going to have to wait on him um, and, you know, not draft him and have to go for other value. But anyway, let's move this phone real quick. Okay, let's talk about some other players, shall we? Let's talk about the the outlook of of Jarvis Landry and perhaps other offensive threats on the Cleveland Browns as we enter the 2019 fantasy football season. So here's the deal. Uh, the one, the initial thought that I had that had popped into my mind as soon as I heard that this trade had, had gone through was Jarvis Landry and Odell Beckham. They both played at LSU together. These guys are brothers. Um, we've seen it in, in years prior that they've always talked about, hey, we want to play together. Uh, when Jarvis Landry, um, you know, his name was out to be traded last season uh, on the Dolphins, you know, Odo Beckham made his pitch, said, hey, go get him, bring him to the uh, to the Giants. Obviously, they weren't, weren't capable of doing that. Anyway, 
So these two players, they have a storied history together. They have experience together. They will make each other better without a doubt. So that was just the first thing that popped in my mind. I was like, goodness, wow. They are, I mean, obviously Jarvis Lanchy was probably banging the table, uh, popping bottles <laughs> with the front office after he heard that uh, his one of his really good friends, Odo Beckham, is coming to town um, to play with him. So anyway, a couple stats I want to read about Jarvis Landry. Last season really wasn't great. Statistically in fantasy wasn't great. Um, compared to his his uh, career average, wasn't great. His catch percentage last season, I know you know Jarvis Landry plays in the slot at a majority, right? Uh, and that's where he's going to stay, even when Odo Beckham comes in. That's where he is most efficient and most comfortable playing in the slot, which is fine. Which is fine because now you add a little bit more talent on the outside, which helps Baker Mayfield spread the ball more. But last season. Um, Jarvis Landry only caught 54.4% of his possible targets, which is absolutely terrible comparatively to the rest of his career. The four years prior in Miami with not so good of a quarterback, Ryan Tannehill, you know, uh, they had uh, Matt Moore a little bit there since Tannehill was hurt. Um, He really didn't have many good quarterbacks, but still at Miami, he had a 70% catch. um, Yeah, 70% uh, catch rate. 70% 70% of the targets that were thrown at him, he caught. So comparatively, 54.4% is not great. But I expect him to improve on that. I don't expect him to go into the 2019 season and be just as bad as he was last season. There is no possible way in hell that, that that's going to be the case, especially with Odo Beckham coming in. It's contagious, right? That talent level is coming into this locker room. Everyone's going to elevate because of it. So I don't expect Jarvis Landry to continue to be bad. And... Here, here's the thing. Even though Jarvis Landry had a, a poor season, he, in many people's eyes, he was going to be a, uh, a kind of a sneaky... I wouldn't say sleeper. He was going to be a sneaky draft pick. He was going to be a guy that we could draft uh, a little bit later in the rounds because of the fact that he did not have a great 2018 season, a memorable uh, 2018 season. So many people were queuing in on the idea, okay, we're going to wait for Jarvis Landry. We're going to sneak him and, and draft him later on draft. That, that, that just blew up. That honestly blew up because I think as soon as Otto Beckham comes into town, that offense is already, everybody's going up um, when it comes to fantasy value and their draft stock. Their uh, their ADPs are definitely rising. So we'll see where they eventually end out, but uh, I think it helps them. Other than that, you know, other offensive weapons, Nick Chubb, Kareem Hunt. Until we figure out how many games Kareem Hunt is suspended for, really can't theorize on where, you know, you can draft him or how much value is going to increase. But Nick Chubb, his rookie year was pretty impressive. The only problem with Nick Chubb is he's not getting much uh, work in the passing game. Duke Johnson's still there, so I expect him just to be a first and second round back, uh, first and second down back. Um, with the addition of Odo Beckham, obviously kind of um, spreads out the offense a little bit more, but no big deal. Don't really think it affects um, Chubb to a, a, like a, a reasonable amount to where, oh my God, I'm freaking out. Chubb's a first round pick all of a sudden, right? Uh, because Cream Hunt is still lurking. Um, other than that, David Njoku last season was the ninth ranked tight end in half point PPR scoring formats. Um, still should be a top 12 tight end this season. Uh, hopefully this goes out, uh, go ahead and helps him, uh, because of the fact that they're spreading out the offense. Uh, to be honest, he was a second leading receiver, had the second most targets, receptions, touchdowns on this team. So, um, I think, you know, his outlook pretty positive going forward because of how, well, he, you know, he's performed in the last couple seasons. So hopefully um, this goes ahead and uh, gives him more opportunity. But we'll go ahead and see where that turns into. Um, just the thing I wanted to mention really quickly, I kind of jotted it down. The Cleveland Browns in 2018 were the youngest team in the NFL uh, from their 53-man uh, roster. You know, the average age was about 25 years old. They are the youngest team in the NFL last season. I think they're going to probably be one of the youngest and they've got a hell of a lot of talent to surround Baker Mayfield. So the outlook of the Browns, goodness gracious, it looks great. Now, before I move on to the Giants, again, on, on the, the Browns subject, let's look about let's look at the division that they play in, okay? The AFC, what are they? The AFC North? Are they the AFC North? I believe they're the AFC North. But either way, the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Ravens, the Cincinnati Bengals, and the Cleveland Browns. Let's look at their teams as a whole as soon as this free agent frenzy is began, okay? The... Baltimore Ravens, their defense was one of the best, if not the best, last season. What happened? Eric Weddle, gone. C.J. Mosley, gone. Um, 
That's their safety. That's their middle linebacker. Terrell Suggs is gone. Zadarius Smith is gone. I mean, they are losing defensive players left, right, and center. I don't know how they're going to stop the bleeding. I don't, they're going to have to bring in more talent. There's no way that they have second-string guys that can fill in and be just as good. They are losing a lot of talent there on that defense, and that is going to hurt them. They're losing, they're losing leadership. Guys like Eric Weddle and Terrell Davis. Um, Terrell Davis, what? Uh, Terrell Suggs. <laughs> Terrell Davis. Um, and Terrell Suggs, that is leadership right there that you're losing for young guys that you want to draft and bring in. It's going to hurt your team there. So the the Ravens, nah, eh, they're not looking great. Unless they go ahead. I mean, offensively, I, I don't know how much I can believe in Lamar Jackson, right? So leaving that, let's just leave it out there. Their defense is losing pieces. Okay, great. What happened to the Steelers? They lost AB and they're paying for it. Okay. Other than that, offensively, they've got to be able to address some other positions. Defensively, they weren't the best last season. That team couldn't even make the playoffs last year. So they're, they're, they're not great. Okay, Obviously, they'll try to improve, but they're not great either. Cincinnati Bengals, they're still garbage. They finally changed their head coach. Great. Until they get rid of Andy Dalton, they're going to be in trouble for the next couple seasons. So as the Cleveland Browns are sitting there and they're scheming, they're thinking, man, we got to strike while the, <laughs> the iron's hot. This division is not as good as it's been in years past. And I think we can make an opportunity in a, in a race to try to win this division and make the playoffs. Because after we went 0-16, we've had a taste for you know how it feels to lose every game in a season. We never want to do that again. We won eight games this year uh, with relative ease, to be honest, on the back of a rookie quarterback. And now that we've established a very good young defense, we're bringing in pieces offensively. Man, I, I think they're going to make their run, and this is the year to do it. So, anyway, those are my, my thoughts on the team as a whole. All right, let's talk about the Giants. Let's talk about the outlook on those players, okay? Specifically, let's talk about let's talk about Eli Manning, okay? Fantasy-wise, you're never going to draft him. Uh, even in a two-quarterback league, he's going to sit on somebody's bench. Um, in a regular league, no one should ever start Eli Manning unless you're absolutely desperate. Um, you have your quarterbacks on bye week, and there's nobody else available. You know, you, I'm sure people have had to do that, okay? That's not a problem, especially in a good matchup. Um, you know, he's performed in the past, no big deal. But when Odo Beckham's out of the equation and he is not there, I expect teams to fill the box, blitz Eli Manning, and bring all the possible pressure you can possibly bring. Bring it all. Bring all the pressure. Defensive coordinators should make Eli Manning's last season a nightmare. They should force this guy to retire. Okay? We know that the New York Giants, all they want to do is hand the ball off, pass the ball to Saquon Barkley. So let's make his life a living hell. Let's stack the box. Let's blitz. Oh, on top of that, all right, who's their leading wide receiver? It's either Sterling Shepard or Evan Ingram, and then perhaps Saquon Barkley out of the backfield. Saquon had uh, 120, uh, 121 targets, 91 receptions, 700 receiving yards, four receiving touchdowns. That's besides the fact, right? So he's potentially one of the leading receivers. But of those three guys, right? I'm pretty sure if you send enough pressure, if you force this offensive line to crumble, especially the right side, which is not as good as the left side of this offensive line, um, and you can bring pressure into the face of Eli Manning, I'm telling you, you can force this team to really struggle. You can force Saquon to struggle. I know he's got a hell of a lot of talent, but this does not help anybody on this team. The only person I potentially think is, is going to help is Evan Ingram. Now, I'll get to my argument there in a little bit, but Eli Manning is, it should have a hell of a season. He, I mean, hell of a season as in they should be bringing hell. They should be bringing corners and safeties off the edge. They should be bringing uh, stunts and blitzing linebackers that are dropping in coverage. I don't care. Do it all. Merc Eli Manning. That is my 100% opinion. You should bring all the pressure and fill the box and prevent Saquon from running. Now, other teams have had that in the past where they don't have much wide receiver presence, but still they can run the ball because as, an, as a running team, they're good. Their running back is talented. I don't think this is going to hurt Saquon to the point where, oh my God, he's the fifth best running back all of a sudden because Odell Beckham's not there. That's not the case. That, that, that is not the case. I obviously think it's going to hurt him because this offense is going to stagnate. They're not going to be able to move the ball as much. Um, you know, If you're three and out consistently punting the ball, you're not going to have opportunities to score fantasy points, plain and simple. So um, it hurts him in that way, and because Eli is just a bum. And we've talked about that to an extent in the past, but um, 
the guy that I think is is most going to have an opportunity to to improve and prove to everybody that he is the second leading offensive, you know, um, producer of this team, I guess. You know, Sterling Shepard, you know, when Odell Beckham doesn't play, he gets more targets, he gets more receptions, you know, that that seems reasonable, right? When your best wide receiver is out, your second wide receiver should step up, should see more targets. That being said, when you have to play against number one corner coverage, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. Now, I expect Sterling Shepard to have a thousand receiving yard season. He should be the number one receiver, um, and he should be a low end wide receiver too, you know, in in this 2019 fantasy football season. But preferably, I, I love Evan Ingram now. Goodness gracious, I think Evan Ingram um, has just jumped on my my tight end ranking board. To be honest, uh, let's talk about Evan Ingram and his production when Odell Beckham is not on the field. So Evan Ingram. In 2017, that was his rookie season. Um, As I mentioned before, Odell Beckham only played the first four games of the season and missed the last 12 due to the fractured ankle. Um, Evan Ingram had 115 targets, 64 receptions for 722 receiving yards and six receiving touchdowns. He was the fifth ranked tight end in half point PPR scoring formats. He led the team in targets, receptions and receiving touchdowns last season. And he was about nine yards shy of passing Sterling Shepard for being the leading receiver on the team as well. So statistically, he was the offense of this team. Yes, they didn't have Saquon. They had a bunch of bums. They were a struggling team, sure. But that being said, um, he produced a lot, right? 115 targets in a season where Odo Beckham was gone and uh, leading the team in almost every possible receiving stat. Uh, that makes a huge difference. And I think that's going to continue because what we saw when Odell Beckham wasn't on the field from weeks 13 to 17 of the 2018 fantasy football season was that Evan Ingram was a uh, a fantasy playoff you know, championship winner. He was on teams that were winning championships because he was averaging nearly 13.4 half-point PPR points. He had games of um, 18 fantasy points, 15 fantasy points, 11 and 9. The dude was tearing it apart. He had 31 receptions within those four weeks, um, and he was a fantasy playoff monster. Besides Derrick Henry, this was one of the guys that off the waiver wire uh, was producing and just was dominating and was winning championships for teams because the tight end position, as bleak and as dry as it was last season, he was a, a little bit of a shining hope in that last quarter of the season, which made a pretty big difference. And as we go into the 2019 season, if he is the leading um you know, wide receiver, you know, tight end in the wide receiver, or wide receiver in a tight end's body. If he's the, the leading receiving option of this team, outside of a Sterling Shepard, Saquon Barkley, I expect him to to produce. I expect him to be a higher valued tight end. You know, he ended as a top five in in uh, 2017. To be honest, I can see him being a top six this season. You know, outside of the guys like Kelsey, Ertz, Kittle, um, I don't know about Ebron, but you know, we can throw Ebon into that hat. Um, you know, th- those are four names. You know, fill up as you may. Uh, as you may. You know, Vance McDonald can be thrown in that argu- uh, argument. Uh, not Austin Hooper. Austin Hooper can go. Jared Cook, he was the number five tight end last season. But is he going to be able to repeat his stats? I doubt it. There are a lot of arguments for Evan Ingram being a top five tight end coming into this season. Especially because of how uh, bad Jimmy Graham was. Trey Burton was terrible. Uh, Greg Olson will likely retire. There are a lot of guys that were, uh, Kyle Rudolph wasn't that great. There are a lot of guys that have been consistent in the past, but just they're, they're getting older and they're not getting as many opportunities and targets. So a guy like Evan Ingram being, you know, potentially the leading receiver of this team come 2019, uh, it makes a pretty big difference. And I'm, I'm pretty excited about Evan Ingram's outlook going into this season. Any other things that we need to mention? Um... Those are pretty much all my thoughts on the the Browns and the Giants going into this season as of right now. Other than that, I want to go ahead, take a second to um, let's talk about a couple of the other free agent signings from today. I probably could make another video, but uh, it's kind of getting late, so no big deal. I stayed up till 1 a.m. uploading yesterday's video, so um, let's see. Who got signed? All right, so we know... Uh, offensively, let's find some names. Mac Paradis, the center for the uh, Broncos, went to the Carolina Panthers. That's good for uh, Christian McCaffrey. Oh, goodness gracious. No, no, no. Stop. Relax. Okay, I'm trying to just read <laughs> the news. <laughs> um, 
that helps Christian McCaffrey. Obviously, going to be replacing um, Khalil at the center position. Um, let's see, where is... I know Latavius Murray went to the Saints today. So what exactly does that mean? Mark Ingram's got to go find himself a new job. Now, whether that's in Baltimore or in New York playing for the Jets, um, he's going to have to eventually find himself a new place to stay or call home. So we'll see where that ends up. Um, but as of right now, it uh, doesn't really you know, surprise anybody that Mark Ingram is leaving. Now, how much does this help Alvin Kamara? I think um, Latavius Murray... Him leaving helps Dalvin Cook more than anybody. Um, I'm pretty excited about that now that Dalvin Cook can have his backfield by himself. Um, but, you know, Kamara still should be a top five running back no matter what. Um, probably even higher because I, I trust Mark Ingram a little bit more than Murray. So hopefully Sean Payton believes the same thing. Uh, another name that I want to throw out, Roger Saffold, um, left guard all pro for the Rams. He is signing with the Tennessee Titans. So... Todd Gurley, uh, you know what's crazy? They have to replace their center, John Sullivan, who was terrible. I mean, goodness gracious, he was awful last season. Uh, and they've got to replace their all-pro left uh, left guard. They're bringing back Andrew Whitworth, which is great, but they've got two holes in our offensive line, and uh, Gurley, he's got arthritis in his knees. So hopefully they can figure that out. Uh, <laughs> Who else was a name that popped up? Cole Beasley going to the Bills. John Brown of the Ravens going to the Bills. I don't know what they're doing. They're just they're just racking up receivers for I don't know what reason, but we'll figure that out, I guess, uh, soon enough. Let me see what other names. These are defensive players. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, oh, my God. The Green Bay Packers made a run at defensive players today, uh, which is good for them. Anthony Barr decided to stay and play for the Vikings. Good for him, blah, blah, blah. All right, but anything else? No, it doesn't seem like it. Okay, so other than that, we're just waiting to see where Le'Veon Bell signs, plain and simple. Um, I'm waiting to see where guys like Mark Ingram, Tevin Coleman, uh, Golden Tate, Michael Crabtree, those kind of uh, higher level guys that we've seen produce in the last couple of seasons, I'm waiting to see where they end up signing. Um, hopefully they get signed soon so we can talk about it. Um, but either way, as I mentioned yesterday, it's Christmas in March. Uh, this is fantastic. I love the trades. I love the signings. And um, anyway... Thank you, everybody, for watching. If you haven't already, click that like button, click that subscribe button, and um, I will probably see you guys later in the week. Just depends how uh, relevant the information is. Hopefully, Le'Veon Bell signs tomorrow, and you can see my beautiful face then. But uh, until then, I'll see you guys, and uh, have a good Tuesday. Peace.